All right, Acts 14. What we're going to talk about, Amanda, is, and I started it a, a while back, I'm going to deal with it again, is uh, why was Paul caught up? We did a little bit on that before, but uh, Paul didn't have to be caught up to get the first revelation he got. Uh, he got that from the scriptures. And it was revealed to him by the ghost, the Holy Ghost revealed to him in the scriptures. And he didn't have to uh, be caught up. And to be caught up, he had to die, basically. And he explains this in 2 Corinthians 12, which we'll get to in a minute. But in Acts 14, there, um, let's read, and I just, just cut in verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing he'd been dead. Now the supposing he'd been dead as far as I can go they believed him to be dead and so they probably are pretty sure he's dead they suppose he is. <clears throat> and um, they drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been dead, howbeit as uh, the disciples stood round about him. Now this, I've got to think about this. Uh, this is not a matter of days. It's not a matter of hours. It's a matter of they're looking at the body. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see, verse 20. Howbeit, as the disciples uh, stood round about him, he rose up. Now, we've talked about it before. The time frame of time and space and dimensions, we, don't, we can't understand because it takes X number of days to go certain places out in space, they say. And I'm strictly going on what they say. And the closest planet is like light years. So uh, how do you do this? I mean, you, you got to think about the Lord. You have to think about his ability and how things are not the way we think. I guess that'd be the best way to say it. And if something happened to Saul or Paul, I apologize. He got stoned, and they supposed him to dead, so they must have believed he was dead. And they drug him out, and they laid him down, or pulled, piled him down, whatever they did to him. And if 2 Corinthians 12 is the actuality of it, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. All right, 2 Corinthians 12. If this is the story of it, and Paul wrote it down, so it's a story of something. 2 Corinthians 12, 1. It is not expedient for uh it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ, or emphasis in Christ, about 14 years ago, whether in the body cannot tell. Whether out of the body cannot tell God know it. Such and one called up to the third heaven. All right. Now, just for as we study, he doesn't save me. He doesn't say I, Paul. He says, I knew a man. And I believe this has a, a, a venue of you study and compare and the Lord will show you. Now look at verse 3. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God no one, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which are not lawful for a man to utter. Of such and one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory but in my infirmities. I think he kind of explained it. He left. 
And it, it's kind of like the type of First Thessalonians, only he was the dead in First Thessalonians. He wasn't alive. They had stoned him. But he caught up. Now, my question is, why does he have to be caught up? He's got the gospel mystery already. The gospel mystery does not take him. It, he does not have to be stoned to see what he, or to hear what he's got to hear. I, I, that's what I want to key up on you for. He he's already received the gospel. Uh, Galatians chapter one: I never received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And no doubt he preaches the gospel in Acts thirteen before he's ever stoned, if that's him. And again, I say, if that's him, comparing 2 Corinthians 12, I'm going to say that 2 Corinthians 12, that he's talking about himself, yet not in the body or out of the body, couldn't tell. But he heard something. And it was, what he heard was unlawful, uh, unspeakable words, which is not lawful to be uttered. Now, time-wise and time frame of Acts, Obviously, there's something that he heard that he can't speak, okay? Now, look in verse uh, 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. All right, again, this is like he's opening the door to you. What I heard and what I know now is uh, abundance of revelation. Okay, so he's he's learned something that uh, well, it's unspeakable. It's unlawful to be uttered. And so in thinking about this, what would be unspeakable? And again, he didn't have to die. He didn't have to be stoned or anything else he was blinded when the Lord appeared to him. And then after his blinding for going into the waiting for Ananias, Ananias laid hands on him. He got baptized, received the Holy Ghost, be filled with the Holy Ghost. So the scripture says so. And from that point on, the spirit can reveal to him the gospel, which is hid in the scriptures. And he says so. He said, our gospel is Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So it's in the scriptures and it takes the ghost to bring it out for him. And he said in 1 Corinthians 2, I never received, uh, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. So he got the ghost, was shown the mystery of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 5 through 8, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And so he didn't have to die for that. But here he dies, or as they said, as was supposed, and caught up to hear something that undoubtedly is so different, it's unspeakable. And that's all that's curious. So let's let's look at some verses. Look in John chapter 17. Now he said he heard unspeakable words. Okay. In John 17, verse 4. I have finished the work. Uh, I have finished. Uh, I apologize. I have glorified thee on your uh, on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. What was it? Verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So they got the word. Okay, turn to Luke 24. And we went over this before, but bear with me. In Luke 24. Now, these people didn't die to get these words. Jesus, for three and a half years, trained them. I mean, they received these words. And 
the words are that he's taught them. Look in uh, Matthew, uh, Luke 24, verse um, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might be, they might understand the scriptures. Okay, well, what was it? 45. Then I opened, uh, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ. In other words, it's written down, and Christ is going to do it. That's just. Anything you ever want to know, is, as it's written, it will be done. No matter if it's delayed right then or sometime future, it doesn't matter. If it's written, it's going to happen, okay? He said, this uh, is written, verse 47, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. All right, now that's not Paul's word. Turn to Acts 13. Where Paul was separated. Now these are the words that Paul has received before Acts 14, the stoning. Okay? In Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. Not remission. So this is not the message of, of John 17. It's not the revealing of Luke 24, because that was repentance and remission. Here is a message that Paul has been shown from the scriptures that he can preach. Now watch. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. That is not what Peter preached. That had nothing to do with it. So before 14, when he's stoned, he's got the words of the gospel. I mean, that's the gospel. Christ died for our sin and was buried and rose again the third day. And it's according to the scriptures. Well, then, it's forgiveness. Uh, Romans 4.25, delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification. There it is, right there. Justification, justified from all things which could not be justified by the law of Moses. So, he's got the mystery of Christ before he's stoned. Then, why does he get caught up? Because he heard some unspeakable words, and it's not lawful to be uttered. So, He's got this abundance of revelation. I mean, he's got this knowledge. And he doesn't want to glory in him in himself. But God gives him some help also. He gives him a thorn in the flesh to bug him. To keep him down, you might say. And um, I told Kathy today, there's something happened to me today that I couldn't explain. As I come in to sell them, I usually figure that these uh, the thorn that I have a lot of times waits for me at the, at the city limits. And when I come in, things begin to happen. I came to the light in Selma on 80, and I look down and I can't shift because my shift rod has come off of my foot pedals. Now, you got to understand something about this. A shift rod ha is a rod with both ends have screw on things with lock nuts. This end came off the rod. And the only way you can get these ends off the rod is you have to take them loose from the shift arms. Otherwise, there's no way they can screw off. And the shift rod came off. And I thought, well, that's a good one because I had to start out at fifth gear, get over to where I could get my tools out and put it back on. 
And lo and behold, it shifted better when I fixed it. And I thought, maybe God helped this fool. Or maybe the gods were messed with this fool and God helped this fool. Despite of the devil. But things like that, just, I mean, when it happens, you just don't know how to explain it because there is no possible way except that it did it. It can't unscrew. It, it, it can't. It can't come, the rod can't come out. And it didn't even mess the threads up or anything. It just came out. And there's my shift rod hanging down and my foot my foot shifters are down on the, the engine. I ain't no way I can shift at all. So I think about that. Well, I think about Paul. He's got some incredible knowledge. And if you don't think so, you read Ephesians and Colossians and see the knowledge he had that nobody knew. I mean, nobody knows. They have no idea what he knows in Ephesians and Colossians. And they're unlawful to be uttered at that time because it's about some Gentiles who in Acts 22, when he spoke the word uh, Gentile, look in Acts 22, In Acts chapter 22, he has a vision. And remember, he said, I, I've come to vision to revelation of the, in the Lord. And the visitation, the, the appearing in Acts 9, where he, the Lord appeared to him. Well, here is a, here's a vision, a trance, right? Look in Acts 22 to 17. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him saying unto me, make haste, haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive the testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they, they know that I persecuted and uh, I apologize, that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when they, uh, the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by and consenting unto his death. There it is. That's the blasphemy he talks about. And kept the raiment of them that slew me, uh, slew him. And here's what the Lord said. He said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And Paul said this in the Hebrew tongue in verse two. And we talked about that before. In the Hebrew tongue, this is a, this is a dirty word that Gentiles, uh, uh, Jews, they don't like this word Gentiles. And it has to do with a nation, a nation that has nothing to do with them. Well, does that not fit Ephesians? But wait a minute. They gave him audience under this word, Gentile. And they lift up their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. I mean, this is anger. And he said he's sending far hence. Ah, wait. Look in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, they were trying to understand, why did Paul have to be caught up and hear something? I thought he had enough. I, I thought he had enough with the gospel. Well, he does for salvation. He doesn't have to be stoned. For salvation message, the gospel of Christ was given to him uh, in the scripture. But he had something given to him that it took him dying and going up in here. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17. And came and preached peace to you which were far off. Well, we know that the gospel is the gospel of peace. We know that Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That message has been preached. He wrote it to the Romans. But all of a sudden here, somebody who's afar off is being preached to. Peace. And before Acts 28, that's not happening. And I could go back maybe to 22 where he sends him far hence. But things just begin to really generate after Acts 22 to 28. 
But at Acts 28, he said, Lo, I turn to the Gentiles. Dirty word. It's those that were afar off have nothing to do with Israel. And then when you read the Ephesian and Colossal letter, you understand this. And you also understand what he heard up there, how it would fit for the Ephesians and Colossians to be written down after his imprisonment, which he's a prisoner for you Gentiles. Okay. Now let's go on uh, in Acts 26. In Acts 26, and Paul was on earth when the Lord appeared to him. So that's not really a heavenly vision. It's a, it's a appearing. That's why he uses the word appearing. But there is a heavenly vision. Undoubtedly, that 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is a heavenly vision. Heard. But... We won't go into that. I mean, it doesn't matter to me. If you want to call Acts 9 a vision, uh, a heavenly vision, that's fine. I believe it's a high calling. But here we're looking at Acts 26. He said in verse uh, 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Now you get three accounts. You got Acts 9 and Acts 22. And both of those give an account of Ananias there. Both of them have Ananias in there, the account of Ananias coming to him. But Acts 26 does not. It doesn't really talk about Ananias there coming to him. And uh, what happened here is that he tells him in 20 and 17, delivering thee from the people. Now, let's go back to verse 16. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I've appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. So he's going to appear to him again. And of course, that trance in Acts 22 and on and on. But look in verse 17. Deliver me from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Well, <clears throat> he sent him far hence in Acts 22. To open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive here it is, forgiveness of sins. The same message of Acts 13, by this message preached unto you, the forgiveness of sins. Well, those that are preached to in Acts 13 are those that fear God. That's what he said in Acts, 20, uh, Acts 13, 26. Uh, the, the, well, I'll just read you the verse. Um, this is what he said in 13, the separation. Verse 26, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you fear of God, but you as the word of this salvation sent. I don't have to make it up. I know who the salvation sent to. I know when Paul separated the salvation sent of those, it's the stock of Abraham and those that fear God. That's what it says. Well, the Ephesians didn't necessarily fear God because one of the things that made people fear God was signs and wonders. The Bible never said that Gentiles don't like signs. The Bible never said that Gentiles wouldn't look at signs. It said Jews require a sign. And so we the Gentiles have always liked signs. I, mean, I hear people all the time, Lord, show me. Well, that's asking for a sign. So if you had signs and wonders were to stop, Acts 28, lo, I turn to the Gentile. Dirty word, not associated with Israel have no God or no hope or no promise or in Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, then they don't necessarily fear God. They hear. Why? Well, Ephesians is very clear on this. They hear. Let's see what it says. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 12. In whom you also trust that you heard the word of truth, uh, 13, I apologize. In whom you also trust that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You heard it. I heard the gospel of my salvation. I didn't have signs and wonders around scaring me. And by the way, if you go to Acts chapter 2, the reason people call on the name of the Lord there is because the sun darkened the moon and blood, things happening all around them. 
in Acts, uh, Romans chapter 10, uh, he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, how shall they call him and whom they not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except to be sent? And you, you find that there were signs and wonders going on, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the I don't I don't find it signs and wonders of the power of God unto salvation. I find the gospel. And the gospel that Paul preached was by this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things which could not be justified by the law of Moses. No doubt, no wonder he's calling the Galatians fools for getting circumcised. They can't be justified uh, by the law because they can't keep it. And furthermore, it's not available. You know what's amazing is people are claiming some things that God won't give them. God will not give you forgiveness for confession. He won't do it. And the God of this world knows that. He will not give you forgiveness by confession because you're denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that would be what the devil wants. He wants you to deny the resurrection because the power of the resurrection is your justification, your forgiveness. And so a person is confessing his sins is denying the resurrection of Christ. You say, oh, Brother Jerry, that can't be right. Well, if Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, you're no longer in your sins, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And if he's not raised from the dead, you're still in your sins. And if you're still in your sins, obviously you'd have to be confessing your sins. But you don't have to confess sins. You confess the Lord Jesus, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And people are fooled by this message by 1 John 1, 9. And it's also in Matthew, if you forgive your uh, debtors and forgive your trespassers, those who trespass, God will give you forgiveness. I, I don't have to forgive someone to get forgiveness. I already have forgiveness. My Lord and Savior was raised from the dead. Be kind, tender, hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Jesus Christ in hell for three days. It's because of your sin. And in hell for three days because of your sins, God forgives you so that his son can come up. That's the completeness of the gospel. Christ died for our sins. Why? He was made sin for us. Who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteous God in him by the faith of Christ, the righteous as God comes. He was buried. He went into hell. His soul was in hell for three days, taking the judgment of our sins so that we would never face the judgment of our sins. And then when he arose, it was because we were forgiven of them. Everything's forgiven. Well, what, what happens if you do wrong in your life? That just works. And works will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ for a saved person to see about the reward. In Revelation 20, judgment of works there to see whether in the book of life and death and hell ain't in it. You can guarantee that. So in Ephesians 1, you hear the gospel of your salvation. What is the good news of your salvation? Remember in Acts 13, to you is the word of this salvation sin. What's the good news to you? You who are aliens, strangers, no Christ, no hope. Hath God forgiven? And how did he do it? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the good news. That's our gospel. We're forgiven. We're forgiven in fact that in his blood, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1. No, no, okay? So <clears throat> look with me in uh, Acts 26 again. In Acts 26, he says in uh, verse um, 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus, at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they 
should repent and turn to God and the works for repentance. That vision he had. Uh, First Corinthians, I think that may be one of the good verses for this. Uh, First Corinthians, here's a repentance of Gentile. In First Corinthians 12, verse 2. First uh, Corinthians 2, 2. First Corinthians 12, 2. You know that you were Gentiles carried away with these dumb idols, uh, even as you were led. And they had turned from their idols. Corinthian letter. They turned from their idols. And they were to abstain from idols. The four ordinances. And there were just things going on in the book of Acts. It just all these legalizers are coming at it hard and heavy at all. And they, they hate the fact that he's relieved people of the, the law and the fact that they he thinks that they think he's destroying the law. No, he's showing the law is fulfilled in Christ. And they're just legalizers everywhere, telling them to be circumcised or be baptized or this or that. And Paul faced a lot of things as he preached. But he had this incredible knowledge that he had to withhold for a while. And when he finally laid it out in scriptures, the devil has hit it ever since. Ephesians and Colossian letter are probably the two most hidden letters in the Bible today in this day and age. And they're absolutely beautiful in what they have revealed. But now let's go on. Uh, look in uh, Galatians chapter one. All right, what was revealed to Paul came by revelation. Without him dying. Okay, let's let's always add that. Without him dying, without him being stoned, this is the revelation he got. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He revealed it. Turn to Romans 16. Okay, Romans 16. Verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. And by the way, Romans 2.16, Romans 16.25, 2 Timothy 2.8, my gospel. He refers to it as my gospel, my gospel, my gospel. It never got it from a man. Neither was he taught it. Ananias didn't give it to him. Peter didn't give it to him. None of the apostles gave it to him. It was by revelation. Now watch. Uh, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So when the world began, since the world began, it's not made known what is going to happen with Christ suffering. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, watch. 1 Corinthians 2, 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world nor the prince of this world would come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now this is before our, before the world. Okay? This this plan is before the world. It's, it's incredible when you think about this. Uh, uh, hold that just a minute. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, Verse five. No, uh, four. According, he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, to be holy and without blame, then there is no sins against you. There's no trespasses against you. You, you are righteous before God. Every, everything is right. You're holy without blood. Now, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be that. Okay? Now, 1 Corinthians 2, that he's, and he set this up. 
And he looked at it all in his foreknowledge. And we were talking about that Sunday in, in church. Before he's looking at all of it. And he sees the day he'll offer you the gospel of Christ. Now, I don't know if you have that day in your your life yet or not. I hope you do. I hope everybody watching had that day. Now, he sees that day that it's offered to you. Okay? And being offered to you. You with me? He said. And he knows your answer. I thank God my answer was amen. I don't know why. God didn't beat me down to get it. I wasn't afraid of signs and wonders. But I heard the gospel. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And I trusted it. I trusted that God had saved me. I didn't trust that he was going to save me. I trusted he saved me. Now, you don't have to know everything for that. You just know that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that is God's way of saving you. It's already done. And so you just accept it. You receive it as a done deal. Well, <clears throat> Paul said that he saw this before the foundation of the world that we should be holding without blame before him in love. Then the Corinthian letter says in 1 Corinthians 2 7, uh, no, uh, I have to cut in verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now we have Romans 8 says that we've been glorified. So there is nobody that can go to God. Why? All the sin that comes short of the glory of God. Only Jesus could go to God. So under our glory, he made it to where we have glory. How to say that to you? Because we can go to the Father because we've already been made complete, Colossians 2, 10, 11, and 12. And Unto our glory, we need glorification. And that's Romans chapter 8. Look in Romans 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to birth. He saw it. He set it up. He didn't predestinated without foreknowledge. He saw it. And what he saw, he predestinated nothing could mess up your salvation. That, that, that ought to change our attitude. That ought to make us think about our God, our Heavenly Father, of what he did and made it right. And it stayed right until it got to your day. That day of your when he saw you. Now watch Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow. Are you thankful he foreknew you? I mean, does that reflect in your attitude towards the Bible? your attitude towards fellowship, your attitude but, but towards everything? Uh, do you have that love unto all the saints? Do you have the uh, uh, cheerfulness of giving? Do you have the uh, 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 the word, escapes me, uh, addiction to the ministry on and on? Or is it just something that comes and goes or leaves? You see, God saw me. Now put in your put your shoes on. God saw me. And he saw me except. And he made everything in that foreknowledge 
all things work together for good to that point. Nothing can mess it up, and the devil's working night and day to mess it up. He's doing everything possible to where whatever God wrote won't work. And he can't mess it up. He cannot touch it. Now, he can work on people. He can work on their minds. And it still won't change what God set up, what God knew. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Somebody said, well, then you're just a predestinator. No, no, no. The predestination is based on the foreknowledge of God. So he predestinated and set it up where nothing could mess it up. And I'm so grateful to be in something that cannot be messed up. He knew he'd seal it. And he did. The moment you trusted, the Lord sealed you. And in sealing you, he secured what he saw. And thus, if something happens to us that we lose our memory, we're sealed. If something happens to us that it gets so bad around us that we have troubles, we're sealed. That's the, the glory of our Heavenly Father. And you remember in 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to read this again and then I'll go to Corinthians. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. So the day was coming when you were going to get called. I mean, it wasn't haphazard. Somebody invited you to a class. It wasn't haphazard that you heard the gospel of your salvation. It wasn't haphazard. It was by the foreknowledge of God. And you came to a point that you heard, you were called, and God knew what you were going to do. The Bible said many are called, but few are chosen. What if you're in a group, let's say it's a group of 300 people, and God's dealing with you? Well, we get the type. See, Paul was in a group of people on the road, and God was calling and talking to him, not them. They heard the voice. They heard the noise. But they didn't hear what he was saying because it was great to call. Well, one day you're sitting in class or somebody's witnessing to you. And it's coming right dead at you. That foreknowledge of God, that predestinated day, when he saw you being preached to with the gospel because it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them to believe. And right there, Right there, you have the opportunity to believe on him. Did you? Or did you mess with it? Fool with it? Were you serious about it? That's between you and the Lord. I needed the Lord. I didn't know how to save myself. And for the first time, I saw he saved me. And I was glad. I was happy. He saved me. And he will never leave me because he sealed me. And the spirit of his dear son's in me, interceding for me, mediating for me, teaching me, comforting me, giving me hope, giving me peace that I never knew before, having peace in times that you shouldn't have peace, it doesn't seem like, having peace with all the things going on around you, peace of God which passes all understanding. I have it written down. None of these things I'm saying aren't written down. I can take it all of them. I got time. They're all written down. Philippians 4, Colossians chapter uh, 1, uh, 12 through 14, 
uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, uh, Romans chapter 8, 29, 30, 31, and all the way to the end of the chapter, uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And on and on. And when did that all, oh, when was it all set up? Ephesians 1, verse 4. According to he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now look in verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, <clears throat> which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Wow. Unto our glory. Go back to 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So God's intention was for people to have glory from him in Christ. Well, then Paul knows this in the Corinthian letter, writes it down. He knows it in his knowledge, then why does he have to be caught up? What is he going to learn there in the being caught up? It's about the dispensation of God. It's about the dispensation of grace. Now that Paul in 1 Thessalonians, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, then we which are alive and remain should be called up. Paul believed he would be called up. Uh, he wasn't looking at 2,000 years out there to get Jerry Sanders. He didn't know about Jerry Sanders. But when he wrote the Thessalonian letter, he knew it was a possibility that he might be called up alive. And he knew, being alive, that God had already made provision for him to be meat for partakers of the inheritance of saints and light. Um, remember that verse. No, no, no. Uh, it, I, I'm going ahead of myself. He knew that he was going to be possibility being called up. So why did he have to be stoned? Why? Well, let's, not, let's look back at this. In Acts 14, he's stoned. He heard something there, and you just read it. You just heard it. The Thessalonian letter is also part of a thing that he heard that no one had ever heard. I've been trying to get work to this, so I'm, I'm, I'm probably failing you on the way I'm working it. No one ever knew about being caught up. Now Paul knows. And it's unspeakable. Ephesians and Colossians, they're unlawful but unspeakable. What are you saying, Paul? We get we could go out alive, go out where? The only thing that was ever taught was Matthew 5, uh, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. The only promise ever given was land. The only promise was the kingdom of heaven. And now you're telling us we could be caught up alive? We could go up? That sounds like a unspeakable word, Paul. And remember, he didn't go to uh, Thessalonica until Acts 17. He was stoned in Acts 14. According to 2 Corinthians, he was caught up. Whether in body, out of body, couldn't tell. Only God knows. Heard unspeakable words, which are not lawful to be uttered. 
Who is it going to be unlawful to be uttering? We, as the body of Christ, can go up. That's our destiny. Our destiny is to leave. Why? We're not appointed under wrath. Uh, you got 2 Thessalonians. Look at 2 Thessalonians. Here it is. In 2 Thessalonians 2 1. Now we beseech you, brother, by the mercies of God, uh, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together in Him. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Caught up together with Him. 1 Thessalonians 4. Now He said, by the gathering together unto Him. Unto Him. Gathering. The only gathering you heard about it in the scriptures was when God would gather Israel together, Jeremiah 31, and they'd be gathered from the east, west, north, and south, never from going up, away. What a mystery. Unspeakable. Why would, I mean, I believe that when Peter said in Second Peter that some of the things Paul writes are hard to understand, even in all his epistles, that's hard to understand if you think about it. You're, you're, going, you're saying what, Paul? We can go up? Go up alive? While well, the, the apostles have been told they're going to die for what they do. Take up their cross. Uh, they got to die, taste death, on and on and on. And there's Paul. He'd be caught up alive. Well, why are you going to be caught up alive? Well, Paul was taken up to see those things. I bought it to hear those things. And he heard those things. And he wrote some things. Later on, he wrote the letters after his stoning. And so you got the Thessalonian letter. Oh my God, where did you hear that, Paul? What are you talking about? Going up alive. And Paul, what's this thing about the Ephesians and Colossians? That's unlawful to be talking about that. Acts, Acts 28. Acts 28, that's some dirty people. You, no. Uh, uh, Acts 22, I apologize. Acts 22, that Hebrew word to them, Gentiles, and you're going to them. And of course, like I said, every turmoil began, and eventually he's in prison. And Paul explains that in Ephesians 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. So as we look at the scriptures, we see things that Paul heard. And he dedicated his life that people could hear those things. And that should be the goal of every preacher, to let people hear things. And by the way, even though it's written down, people aren't hearing it. So saying things like the caught out alive or people that had no Christ, no hope, no nothing, now had Christ in them, the hope of glory from hearing the gospel of their salvation, who were already forgiven, who were already translated in the kingdom of his dear son, a major, a major discovery is Colossians 1.13. He's, we're, we're translated in the king, already translated in the king of dear son. Let me read that to you so I don't misquote it. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We're already translated. Those things are unspeakable. And to who he's talking about, it's unlawful. Uh, the legalizers wouldn't, wouldn't put up with that for a minute. And of course, He's already in prison when he writes these letters. And so you know, one of the guys say one time, he said, he's in prison about to be hanged. He said, what are you going to do, kill me for saying something else? I mean, you know, hey, somebody said one time they killed somebody. And they said, well, you ain't going to hang me twice and kill another person. Well, same thing. Paul is a prisoner and he's not unhappy about it. He's not comfortable. By no means, but he's not happy, unhappy about it because he's writing down things that are going to be such a glorious, beautiful thing to people that had no hope. And it kept them from being judged. I mean, 
Colossians 2, I let no man judge you in certain things. I mean, and that you were uh, sealed, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Ernest, uh, look in Ephesians chapter 1 again, verse uh, 12, 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. You have an inheritance, Ephesians. Colossians, you have an inheritance. Uh, look in Colossians 1. Verse, uh, the mystery, the revelation of the mystery, which had been kept secret, but hidden God. Verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have no pride now. You got Christ in you, the hope of glory. What an incredible message. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Written by a man in prison who had been stoned, caught up and heard unspeakable words, which are unlawful to be uttered. The things that Paul talked about are hard to understand, but they also didn't fit into the characteristics of the Jews' knowledge. And they didn't fit into Peter's knowledge either. He had to show him things. And when Peter read the epistles of Paul, he said, some of the things that he writes in there are hard to understand. Well, you bet it's hard to understand being caught up alive. You bet it's hard to understand that Gentiles, that aliens and strangers that didn't fear God, didn't work right, and anything else are trusting the Lord. They're here to hear the good news of their salvation, the gospel of their salvation. Yeah. I hope I didn't confuse anybody, but amen. 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 Well said, Jerry. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen.